Hi, I'm John McMurray, and this is Baxter Matt Kruger, Murray. and we're here to uh, talk with Jordy Ziegler and Marty um, about books that they've written. And uh, first question I wanted to ask is maybe just kind of an introductory. Why don't you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves and your journey? Um, how does someone get to be a theologian and write a theology book? So, Marty, you want to start? Absolutely. So I was born in Seattle, Washington, and my dad was a science teacher who was the son of a Presbyterian minister who converted out of Christianity when he was 50. My mom was a deep-hearted, lovely person and grew up in the Salvation Army tradition, so I had a heart person and a head person, and they, in a sense, split for me. And so my life has lived within, what does it mean to be a whole person, head and heart? The question as I went on through my high school years of what is the meaning of Christianity as not something that we just live in our head, but that shapes our life became really important. So relational theology was a term that came across my window screen at about age 18. But it was something that people largely said, oh, that's just psychology. And so I spent 20 years of higher education asking, how do we have a proper theology of who God is that informs the nature of what it means to be human beings who are creating God's image for a relationship with God and one another? So I have spent many years in school and taught at many schools on relational themes. I call myself a relational theologian. Um, see myself as part of the Northwest and saying this is an, a region of creativity. And so I'm also involved in, in gathering schools in the region to ask how can we be kingdom of God people and build relationships that are a function of the theology that I teach to say how do we be God's people for a world that may or may not know God. But here is where we live. So I teach, I do marriage and family therapy, I write books, I travel the world and speak. And I'm concerned that uh, people really learn that it's all about relationships. So that's a very short nutshell. Would that be your, your summary of what you do is it, it's all about relationships? I mean, like one sentence summary of... So my, I, I say my theology in a nutshell is God exists in relationship and all God does is for the purpose of relationship. And so that's what we need to be about. Good, good. So, just a quick follow-up. Yeah. Did you have uh, formal education in psychology as well? I do not. Or was it all theology? Formal yeah. is the... As I mean, the word, yeah, I don't have it. My degrees are all in biblical studies and theology. Okay. So, I have two, two undergrad degrees, two master's degrees, PhD. My postdoc was really working on the question of contextualizing family system therapy within Trinitarian theology, which I did at Regent College. Okay. My doctorate was with Alan Torrance and Douglas Campbell at the University of Otago, Dunedin, New Zealand. So I spent three years there. Terrific, thanks. So, I didn't realize that Douglas Campbell was, that's, that, I knew that there was a real connection between them, I didn't realize it. And they were they best were friends there. The, yeah. the conversations that they had were really wonderful. Yeah, that, was, so, that would have been amazing. Huge, huge influence on each other and on me. And of course, Douglas, um, you know, credits J.B. Torrance for really being influential on him, really coming to understand theology and credits him in his Doorstopper book. Well, you can, even if you didn't credit him, you can see his can see it. heart and some of his language in the book. His influence, for sure. Yeah. So because of them, I get to be thoroughly biblical and thoroughly theological and see no problem with that. So what do you find inside of the United States, for example? How has, what kind of responses are you getting from different churches, groups? Do you get a lot of invitations to speak in non-church settings, or is this primarily within a denomination, or... What so I am, I am owned by no one, so I, I work with all kinds of, of groups of churches. So I've taught at most of the schools in the Seattle area, from Pentecostal schools to Seattle University's Jesuit. So I cross over those boundaries. I do a lot of work with churches on questions of theology and what does it mean to reboot the church in relational ways of thinking. But I also do divorce recovery, addiction recovery. So I'm dealing with those systemic issues. So those take me into people's lives who aren't necessarily part of the church, but are dealing with real life issues. So for them, it's to take them from where they are into a beginning point of how do we understand what it means to be persons who are broken and how to think out of a different That's paradigm. That's fantastic, man. That's fantastic that you've got a wide range. It will, um, that's really good. The other little piece there is that I have three kids by my first marriage. I've, I've gone through a divorce and I'm remarried, so that that breaking of life has been part of the story of saying what the heck happened there and what does it mean to be to, to learn out of that brokenness and to go on into something that's a whole well you, you can't live in your head when you go through that you can't and you really need to, to relearn it because there's oh, another good. way to be 
My middle daughter, though, on the day she graduated from high school, said, Dad, I think I'm an agnostic. So my third book begins with, we all begin as agnostics. And I can say to my daughter, you know, thank you so much for being honest with me. I'd rather you be honest because I know God loves you no matter what. But let's begin. We're all agnostics. Let's go from there. And yeah, let's find out what God she's not sure about. Yeah. So I'm, pro you, I'm probably agnostic too. If that's who's well, let's be agnostic about that. <laughs> but it opens the door to say, you know, we all have to discover all of life and all of human relationships. And you know what? They don't teach those classes in school. And the church doesn't do much better than the schools are really teaching us what is a relationship with God, with one another, and even ourselves look like. So we really are best to start at ground zero and start building. We live entirely in the womb by gift. We are entirely gifted and we have absolutely no knowledge of that. The day you come out, you're still entirely living by grace and by the gift of those who care for you. But we forget it. We forget who we are. We forget that we have been sustained. Let's hold that for a second. Okay. I see that going off, and, oh, and then Jordy will never have a chance to speak. So Perfect. Thank um, you. That's awesome, though. That really is. So, Jordy, how about you? Same question. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm a pastor. Um, I didn't intend to be a pastor originally, but um, I just had a lot of questions, and that sort of drove me further and further into that. I, I think for me, there's always been questions around the Trinity and making sense of it. It was, I was, I had a mathematical mind initially, and so the Trinity was this problem to be solved and to be worked out, and, and then the Trinity was kind of a, a tag team experience, so the Father creates, the Son redeems, the Spirit carries us through to the end. And these, these answers to the Trinity, I never found very helpful in living. And um, for me, there was a real, draw to, to study theology um, because I, well, the thing that, that drove me to, to do a PhD was discovering that this could actually be life-giving. And there's a story behind that. But, um, okay. So it's life-driven. Life well, yeah, so I was, I, I was halfway through my seminary studies at Regent College and I was sitting in a class with a guy named Alan Torrance who made us read a book by T.F. Torrance, and I'd never read a T.F. Torrance book before. Which one was? The Mediation of Christ. <laughs> and as I was reading this book, Oops. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm mostly done with seminary already, I feel like I'm reading the gospel for the first time. Um, and the key piece, I think, that was not on the table for me before was that when Jesus goes to the Father, he takes our humanity with him. So it basically it was a doctrine of the ascension, which I had always assumed that he sort of just became a ghost again or became a spirit and left behind humanity. Hmm. So for me, if, if what God did in Jesus is not just a 33 year old, a 33 year long job, mm -hmm contract, you know, he's under contract for 33 years and then he can go back and be God again. If it's actually a change in the life of God for eternity that now makes a space for me and all humanity um, to, to live in that, then that, that just changed, that blew apart my vision of the love of God. Um, and the nature of salvation and what Jesus has come to do and, yeah. and how it lives out and Everything. Everything had to be rethought on a new one. Yeah. And so those dominoes started falling and I left seminary and, and became a pastor in a church and tried to work, work it out, but felt like I needed more tools to do that. Um, I was really blessed by your books, Baxter, um, along the way, because you were the only person I knew that was trying to unpack this theology for for the layperson and for the for the like regular pastor person for human beings for human beings because um, reading Torrance was was beautiful but challenging <laughs> and uh, challenging yeah yeah theological science that, that was, was so polite that, that was great yes. that would be challenging so we had um, you guys know Andrew Purvis mm -hmm. um, so he came to our church in Sacramento and he was going to do a pastor's workshop mm -hmm. And he had written a book recently on the crucifixion of ministry. It's a fantastic book. And he preached in our church before 
the preaching workshop, and in the traditional service, at the end of his sermon, the people clapped. And they, they, they clapped for like good music, but you never clap for a sermon. And they weren't clapping because it was a great sermon. It was a good sermon. They weren't clapping because it was a great sermon. They were cheering the good news of the gospel that they just heard. Um, he talked about how Christ grabs hold of us and he had us reach behind our back of our neck and pull up as a reminder of he will not let you go. And people were, I think, stunned by the gospel. And, and in that moment, that was kind of the sense of call to me that all this interest in Trinitarian theology, it's not just curiosity, it's a, Jordy, you need to go. Go to Scotland, go somewhere where you can dwell in this so that you can come back to the church that needs to understand this message. So that's kind of what sent me out in 2007. And It's really not about Trinitarian theology. It's about participating in Jesus' life with the yeah. Father and the Spirit. We use that language, yeah. but I don't even like the language because now it's becoming, you know, J.B. would say jargon. The language yeah. of participation. Well, the language of Trinitarian. Trinitarian. Yeah. It's like, the, you know, the yeah. one, one lady said to me, she, she said, well, last year we did spiritual gifts and this year we're doing the Trinity. <laughs> Yeah. And then we'll move on to something. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's so many different conversations around the Trinity, and and different ones that are important to have, but but so many of them are dissecting conversations rather than living conversations. Yeah. I mean, I, it seems to me that that the beautiful thing that I'm hearing is that you have seen and experienced the fact that the Trinity is relevant to every facet of our humanity. Mm-hmm. To liberate us, mm-hmm. to free us, and it's, so it's not a theological discussion. It's about life. Mm-hmm. And look here, this is the gospel, and, yeah. and the early church was on about it. And then we went off the rail in the West, and you know, f- lost our minds for fifteen hundred years, and yeah. now we're coming back. So it's thrilling to me. To I mean, I know you. I don't. I don't I, we hadn't had much conversation more, but yeah. Jordan, <laughs> um, fellow Aberdeen graduates, along with George McDonald. <clears throat> I was going to just say, I was going to do JB, but he said, "Sorry, I'm retiring, but I think my son would be an appropriate next person oh, for you." Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, but what a what a fortuitous turn of events too to be with Alan and. and it was just what God yeah. needed to do. So, yeah. and I did study with JB in Seattle. Fuller brought him in in mm-hmm. the '80s, so I did study with JB as well. And then was his marker when he would come Con- to town. Confessio, contritio, satisfactio. <laughs> Whatever that. <laughs> no, that was JB, one of JB's favorite. I mean, lectures. He'd get on a roll. He'd talk about confessio, contritio, satisfactio. And he would say, if you confess your sins, and if you're contrite, and if you make satisfaction, then and only then will God be gracious and forgive you. So said the Catholics. And he would go, Calvin and Reformers said, no. <laughs> And he You're would do it. Good at that. Well, 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 he got it down. <laughs> oh, yeah, listen, man. He had, he had a, uh, another one he would do. He, he would talk about my good friend Roland Walls. He's gone to the Catholics, you know. <laughs> and so, just a quick interlude. He, com- he comes to Jackson and does a series of lectures for us in our ministry there. And he's on a roll. And he tells his stories. And everybody's laughing when he goes, you know, Calvin and Reformers said no. And everybody's laughing. He's like, he can't figure out why they're laughing. So that night he says, was I unclear? I said, no, 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 you were real clear. He said, I just didn't understand when people laughed. And uh, I said, well, I said, you may have been in, you know, <laughs> I may have told you before. Yeah, <laughs> <seen this> before. <laughs> so he, he had a, it was funny. Oh, man. <laughs> I know who will be the star of the movie when they make a movie about JB. Yeah. There you go. Certainly an interview would be in order. That would be, yeah. Oh, yeah. He had, he had a, a lot of stories that he told. And one about the man he met on the beach in mm-hmm. California. Did I throw him back upon himself? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> he had those, those classic Scottish eyebrows. And he, he had a, a 30-year-old black teaching gown with 30 years of chalk dust. And he was left-handed. Or he, he, when, he, when he got on roll, he would use the left hand. He, he would grab this. He had those little glasses. like His hair was going back. And he was... And Let so me draw he, that backward here. A he, little what, <laughs> he did the same diagram every day. I had this, this, you've seen the, the chalkboard, it rolls. Mm-hmm. It's exactly the same way it was when I was there. So JB came in, and, it, and so he's, 
he pulls down the uh, chalkboard to roll it down to the next thing, and his diagram's already on there. He still should put it on there for him. <laughs> <laughs>So Marty, let's let's pick up a little bit on uh, what you started to roll out there, because it sounded uh, that you were getting really more toward the heart of what you are trying to do with teaching and being involved. You said that you're involved with addiction, broken marriages. Yeah. Roll that out a little bit for us. So how, theolog- does, how does Trinitarian theology yeah. in your mind speak to these things? So I'm a theologian first, and all that is the outworking of it. So, I mean, one of the concerns people have this day is you just have human needs and you go to God to kind of get them met. For me, there was a sense, though, that really the question, I grew up in a Presbyterian context, and there was something that was missing in that context about a passionate life with God and one another. Mm -hmm. So my journey really was one of saying, it seems like there's got to be more here. And it seems like understanding who God is is really at the center of what that looks like. So I love Simon and Garfunkel's song, Sounds of Silence, and the phrase, fool said I do not know, silence like a cancer grows. Hmm. So in some ways, my journey has been shaped by recognizing we basically don't know or hear one another, and we don't know or hear God. We've defaulted to statements about God that really miss the conversation, the dialogue, which means we basically have no relationship with this being. We just talk about God like he's an old man in the room, and we're talking about what our future is going to be now that he's out of the way. Mm-hmm. So when I sat down to begin to write the book, I just asked myself the question, you know, what have been the aha moments for me in this 20-year journey of finding language and being with people, going through a divorce, getting married again? What is it that has made the difference to say the silence is not necessary? Or at least we can begin to live into the silence in a listening way where we begin to hear the God who speaks even in silence. So to then ask the question out of my brokenness of my marriage, you know, what was my, what was my part in missing and how do I rediscover the God who speaks? And everybody thinks we're basically in a divorce with God. God left and we're left to ourselves. But to say, no, this God is present and active and speaking, but we're told we're supposed to hear the shepherd's voice, but I know very few people who confidently say, yep, every day I hear the shepherd's voice. And so I have really tried to press into the question with the help of a number of people. In my doctorate, I worked with the other John McMurray, mm-hmm. with a little M instead of the big M, a Scottish philosopher, who was really a, a Christian who got fed up with the church. But he didn't get fed up with God or the idea that we are made as relational beings. And so McMurray really helped me to enter into an understanding of the person and the personal relationship in a way that recognized that at the core of our being and our natural self, we are fear-based people. We need to protect ourselves. We need to survive. Yep. Quick uh, parenthesis. What are some of the books? I know persons in relation to self as agent, but what else from John McMurray did you find? So reason and emotion. Reason and emotion. Which in a nutshell to say, we're told not to deal with emotions, but what if reason is merely highly developed emotion? What if we, in every act that we have, are motivated to do it, and that's our emotive world, and either it's coming from love or it's coming from fear, which means either we're going to embrace or separate ourselves. and if we really don't know the nature of the other, fear is going to probably dominate, so you end up with a society and a theology that's all about fear that essentially church. breaks everything down. In the church. So a book like that just says, wow, we have been organized around fear that is self-protective. And then the clue to history, in there he impacts all of Western culture, the Roman, Greek, and Hebrew, out of an understanding of the motive of how fear and love works, and that we have still yet to see a Christian culture based in love. They're all based in fear. The Roman Catholic, the Greek Orthodox, the Protestant is just a protest out of fear that has left us again lacking with what it means to really know and engage the God who, in the person of Jesus, McMurray says, is the clue to history. So that's that's his best book, I think. It's a great it's a great book. I didn't know you'd written all these books. <laughs> Interpreting the universe is very much I'd be behind T. F. Torrance in a sense of saying, you know, T. F. and Michael Polanyi to say. We are personal knowers in the world, and so we have to acknowledge we are persons and we know the world,
But the world is there not just as an object. We indwell it. We know this other. And so we enter into what he uses in the person's relation, the field of the personal. Mm -hmm. And so where Einstein and others of the great science understood it's all field thinking, everything's interrelated, McMurray really pushed into the field of the personal to say, you know, God is the origin and source of that. And when we understand it, how we relate to all the world is in personal ways. So either we're going to learn the language of the personal and recognize persons, or we're going to live as objects in an objective world, and we'll lose connection with one another, and we'll become depersonified in a way that loses all that really sustains us. As and we're completely depressed. Yeah, and this comes out even, I mean, it comes out in our religious expressions. It even comes out in the way the Bible gets translated. God objectifies us. We turn around and return the favor. We objectify him. The stain is deep yeah, yeah, of how deep. he pollutes our understanding. Yeah. So we're talking about commodities and objectification. Yeah. And, and even human units. Sure. So my doctor is on the question of what does it mean to be free person. So for McMurray, to be a free person is to see another as a person and to be their friend. I become fully who I am in the presence of one who I acknowledge and know them as a person. And we create the freedom by being in relation with one another to be all of who we are. So to say that even our freedom is based on the way we are with another, it's not with the Western ideal of freedom from... It's not independent. It is not independence. So the second person was John Zazulis, who I worked with. And so being as communion to say, yep. the eternal God and the most concrete thing in the universe is the communing relation of Father, Son, Spirit. That is the foundation of reality. So that freedom that we have is when we participate in the eternal God's life, that freedom is a participation in the family of God, not living out of our biological existence, but our ecclesial existence as those in the body of Christ who are fulfilled by being the part of the body that we are. And then Carl Barth was my dominant major partner. And so for Carl Barth, of course, the person of Christ is the one who wins our freedom, is our freedom, is free for us, grants us our personhood in affirming us as his own, and so out of that, that whole study to begin to look at the nature of all the ways that we are unfree in broken relationships and marriages in families that look like they're together, but it doesn't take very much to sniff out. Everybody's afraid of dad here. Everybody's afraid of the pastor here. This is not a relational community. They smile, but they're dead inside. They have no sense of an ability to be open with one another. Fear dominates this place. And so you gain the eyes to see that once you begin with God and the way of the being of God and what it means to be free, suddenly everything starts showing up of what unfreedom looks like in our culture, in our families, in the way we think about who it is as persons, which we really mean individuals, but it's all silence. It'd be a great book. Unfreedom. <laughs> Unfreedom? Un 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 well, Unfreedom. Unfreedom. This it's is sort of the positive version. Well, the first one, miss, missing love, goes into the whole nature of fear as unfreedom. The discovering relational is more of the nature, the positive side of what freedom looks like as a, as a human way of being. And then the third one really goes into how is that the very life of what it means to share in the life of the Trian God? It is to enter into that, into that space. So, so you're, t you're taking people on kind of a logical progression through this. Um, if, if by logic, it's theologic. Okay. Right. Crystallog. It's crystallogical. But a developmental but progression. It is a developmental so, progression. I, I take people very much through my story okay. into the ideas that became aha moments for me. Which, whenever I sit with people in a room, I, I do things like, before we get going, would you mind if I just ask if someone would be willing to volunteer to answer a few very personal questions? Can I get a volunteer for that? <laughs> and what do they do? Yeah. And maybe one bold one will do, but I said, your response was the answer I was looking for. Do you recognize that the personal for you is the hiding part of you? It's the stuff you don't want anybody to see. You are all separate and afraid of one another, but you don't even know it. And personal by it. definition means stuff you don't want. It's like shame. The re I mean, if you ask for a definition, they tell you something, but the way they respond to that right. says, it's the so shame, it's the right. guilt. And the few that do raise their hand and say, what are the questions you thought that I was going to ask? Mm -hmm. And it's about my sex life, and it's about my failures. It's like, so the personal for you is all the stuff you want to hide. Mm -hmm. The chief rabbi of London once said, in the war, it wasn't cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. It was incognito, I hide, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. That is the default 
of our humanity. Mm. We are living as those who need to hide from one another and from God because of the fear of the judgment that comes if we come out to play. Right there in Genesis 3. It's right there. That's in book one. <laughs> I sounds, like, about that. sounds like darkness and separation to me. So. Yes. Awesome. Thanks. Well, you know, as you're talking, I'm, I'm just thinking about grace cause, and, and how so much of the Christian life gets reconstrued in impersonal ways. Um, and one of the things that was a revolution for me in, in working on the, the project of the book was the way Torrance approaches grace. Um, in some ways, we were talking about the challenge of the word Trinity and how that means so many different things to different people. On one level, Trinity for Torrance means grace. Mm -hmm. um, it is the, or Trinity at least toward us, um, not, so, but grace in our world, so often it, it's like commodities in a bank. We can store it up or we can get it by, you know, doing the right thing and we get a big bank account with lots of grace or. Stain or, remover. Or, or the grace becomes a, um, a legal thing, so we draw all of our, our metaphors from the law court kind of imagery when we talk about grace, and it's very transactional. Or grace is kind of like a tool, like a, you know, here's my tool belt, and I can, I've got more grace with these different things that I can, you know, if I do this or I do that, then I can, they're, they're means of grace. And some of that language is problematic because it be, can become very impersonal in the way that, and if grace is our primary descriptor of our relationship to God and we use impersonal kinds mm -hmm. of metaphors for what grace is, then God becomes kind of a machine in some way that's subject mm -hmm. to these sets of rules and laws. Whereas for Torrance, I think grace for him is God coming to us, wrapping his arms around us and taking us into his communion, his life. Mm -hmm. And that gift of himself personal for the purpose of relationship. So adoption to me is the, the greatest image of God's grace. Mm -hmm. because it, is, it cannot be detached from Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you can if you can write a sentence and use grace, what I used to tell students, if you can write a, st a sentence and use grace and not substitute the name of Jesus for mm -hmm. grace, you're missing the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that, that is like... Right. It's like when Paul says, you know, because of the extraordinary nature of the visions he was given, that God sent a messenger from Satan, and he asked for it to be removed three times, and the response was, my grace is sufficient. Mm -hmm. My recognition, my presence in your life is sufficient for you. Right. And but grace is another one of those terms. That, right. What does it mean right. if it gets attached from Jesus? And when we say Jesus, we can't say Jesus and not also think Jesus who is in relationship with the Father through the Spirit. And I think for most Christians, and when they say- And creator and sustainer of all things. Right, huh? yeah. And for most Christians, when they say, when you say, think Jesus or say Jesus, they think Jesus as an isolated individual. Mm -hmm. Detached. Detached uh -huh. from the Father. Didn't really need the Spirit because he was sort of Superman in some way. And another, a, another instance of a single human being mm -hmm. a detached from everything. Right, so even like, I, the song in Christ alone well Jesus is never alone <laughs> he's always with the Father through the Spirit that's what made him Jesus so we you know if you fill that in when you're singing the song it's fine but if you actually think that Jesus can live alone then you've blown apart the Trinity which goes back to personhood yeah. right? the way we define persons as individuals yeah. as opposed to persons in relation yeah. you know from Zizolus and The Zeus's book, both of you guys, I'm sure you read that too. Um, being as communion. Yeah, being as communion. He, yeah. it's ma the first half is magnificent. Yeah. And then he flips over into... Especially chapter one. Institutional Christianity. And I, I, mean, I literally, when I first read that, I thought, well, maybe this book has missing chapter. Because I cannot figure for the life of me how you can go from that there. to institutional Christianity. It's like, what? You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And I just was curious if you, if you saw that and like, what do you think? And... 
how do you go from what he's saying to that? Because that's the problem. I mean, we, we hear all of this and then we turn around and package it in a, in a context of non-relationship in a church. And so I, I go to John McMurray to critique John Sazoulis. Um, John McMurray, the other John McMurray, <laughs> says that when we respond to fear, either we respond with fight to our fear or flight. Um, love allows us to engage, but fear always causes something that's reactive and responsive. So to say that the nature of when Christianity hit Greek culture, which is the culture from which our philosophy, all of our abstract thinking comes from Greek culture, that's flight. We respond to the world by thinking about it, and Greek Orthodox theology largely sees a view of God that is separated from the world. So what is communion? It's a participation in the true communion that is in heaven, which means this isn't true here. So what is our job here? It's to create the institutions that allow us to see the other that's there, but we're philosophers in a sense, who have practices for people to participate in with bells and spells and things that, that point to another reality as though this isn't the real reality, right? The so it becomes shadowy. And Roman Catholics are the fight. Control, manage, organize, create hierarchies, manage everything. That's what Roman culture did. And that's what Roman Catholicism had given to us. And guess what Protestantism did? More management in a fractured kind of way, but it still works at the basic core of we got to make sure we get it right. I'm afraid of what happens if we don't. And so we really didn't get away from it. So it feels like a more practical Christianity than the Orthodox who would go, oh, they've got all that icon stuff and everything. But the managing even of that through what you identify as the institutional part of Orthodox thinking means that they've, they've missed what it really means to live with the kind of personal relationship in the human sphere that Zazulus attributes to God, mm -hmm. right? It hasn't worked itself out. And so the constitutor of a community is the episcopos. The priest is the constitution in whom the people see themselves in that person who is their representative, goes through the, in the worship service, through the... Brad Jerzak would be fascinated by this. Hmm. Yes. Oh. But you can see it, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean... And so he goes into the court of God, right? Because we're not living as though this is the court of God. So we're having something that it feels like to them, and I'll use this positively, the art of here to represent the other. But art is McMurray's definition of the whole Greek and all forms that come from that. Art isn't the real reality, but art can be something that actually allows you to engage. So word and story and parable, all those things can be used where you really connect with the other person. So metaphor, I say, is the stethoscope of the heart. When Jesus says, I'm the great shepherd, he's using an image, but it gets us to the reality. We really hear the heart of God. So if we can say, there is a place for a redemption, I think, of a story that Zazilus begins, but we need to bring it together to have a love-based way of thinking that allows us to really be persons with one another and affirms the full reality of physical reality as well as the spiritual and brings it back together in ways that I think I've been hearing about for the last couple of days, right? Mm -hmm. And it's missing that, right? And both would think, they think they have the whole thing, but they can't see because mm -hmm. their own fear blinds them from seeing the fracturing. Well, it, it, in some ways, it's like for 2,000 years, we haven't really taken the Trinity seriously. And, and we're beginning to realize that this has implications for everything. Um, and there's uh -huh. a particular um, Scottish theologian right now who's writing, you know, about the contemporary Trinitarian revival and saying, you know, do you think we've had it wrong for 2,000 years? And I'm going, yeah, I think, I think so. And so we can't just go back to the 4th century and think that's going to get us what we need because even the formulations of the Nicene Creed, if you don't read them out of the love of God that's witnessed to in the person of Christ, they become a Greek form of philosophical thinking where you get all the words and it's institution. You've created the institution but missed the spirit who indwells it and gives it life. And I think for a lot of people, their doctrine is just an institutional form of replacing God with a bunch of words that live in our head. It's abstract. It's the flight. Yeah, the nice thing and it makes is, me feel good. is as good as you can have a guard that, that points you to relationship in words. So um, McMurray's most famous phrase, the other McMurray, all meaningful knowledge is for the purpose of action, not just thought, 
But it's knowledge because it's for action, and all meaningful action is for the purpose of friendship, which in another place he would say is communion. But it's not just communion of Sunday, it's the real coming to know and to know that we are known and to live out of that and the being known, anything less than that. So again, I think that John McMurray is a better theologian than John Zazulis. But Zazulis has a piece that McMurray <clears throat> needs, right? We, we need the full conversation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's a great way of putting it. Because I love McMurray, I mean, uh, uh, Zazulis', Zazulis. first chapter to whatever. Absolutely. As do I. But it, it leaves me like, okay. Right. So what's fascinating about you guys is all of a sudden within the depressed isolated Western Christianity, there's emerging a, a vision of how we relate to one another in, in the light of and in participation with the way God, the Father, Son, and Spirit relate to one another, and we're included in that. So it's no longer a theology. It's, uh, it's a vision. That's it's th theology taken to its proper ends. Yeah. When people say, oh, you do practical theology, it's like, no, I do theology taken where God and the Bible want it to go. Show me some place where Paul doesn't take it right down to, so now start acting this way with one another. Which JB always said, you know, the first half is this is what God's done, and here's now act like it. Right? And so that's all I'm doing is just following the Which logic. Which is kind of when Torrance talks about theology needs to be scientific. What he means by that is it, it needs to sort of obey its object and follow its object. So if its object is leading us into relationship, then we go with it into that, yeah. rather than just stand back and we just want to analyze it, and use it as a metaphor. What was the single point, if, or a couple of points where it really, your brain just went upside down? Yeah. And you begin to see- You mentioned one region, but yeah. more than that. I mean, the big one, that sort of has had this continuing domino effect was that Jesus didn't leave behind his humanity. But the, but the relevant questions to that became, so when we say you're in Christ, Christ is in us, what does that mean? Um, as a pastor, in a, so after seminary, I was in pastoring and saying these things and trying to understand what the New Testament was talking about. And I felt like I I'll say this and I'm entering mystery and I don't know, if they ask me questions, what's behind that? I don't know what to say. Um, and so there was this real desire to understand what does it really mean for us to participate in Christ? Um, when I looked at, I was a spiritual formation pastor in my first church and worked with all the small groups and formation things. The best stuff out there, the basic approach was, if you train really hard, then you will become the person you're meant to be. Mm -hmm. you, know, you would be able to do the kind of things that Jesus does if, if Jesus were in your place. Which, on a external level, is true. I mean, I can go out and start running and eventually run a marathon. But is that participating in Christ? And that's kind of where I, I, I felt a, a disconnect between what, what's the theological base of living in this kind of grace of my life, um, sharing in the life of Christ versus a, a way of viewing the Christian life as you just uh, train harder and then uh, you won't just be trying because you'll have become a different kind of person who, who is... Uh, stronger and you know the Holy Spirit helps you a little bit along the way. So really what I felt was lacking and kind of where my passion is with with a lot of what's in the book is what work does the continuing humanity of Christ do in our ongoing Christian life? Um, or have we so separated the role of the Spirit that the Spirit becomes this impersonal helper and Jesus is kind of a past you know, his job is over and passed, and the whole language or the understanding, what does it mean to be in Christ in a participative way is lost. Um, so a quick question, a yeah. quick diversion actually. Um, in that difference that you're describing, uh, help us understand the word discipline from your context then. Mm -hmm. I'm all for spiritual discipline, so reading the Bible, prayer, fasting, 
Sabbath, um, serving, um, you know, worship, all those sort of spiritual disciplines, spiritual exercises, kind of everything that we do in the Christian life is what I'm thinking. How do we, do we see those as stuff we do in response to what God did? Or are they somehow a sharing in the life of Christ? And how do we see our life as a sharing in Christ's life rather than as a response to something that he did? And even if it's a response of gratitude, if my response stands alone and is independent. If you, if you perceive it as your response, yeah, you, you still missed me. Calvinism is great. I mean, in terms of its vision of union with Christ, Calvin was great, but the question that it's like it's it's still united with a distant person who really died and left us some information and, and we're downloading the information. It's not this rich vision of the early church. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like to me, you're saying we, we've missed this piece and we got to go back into, and it's not a piece, it's, it's the piece. It's the centerpiece. And, and so in, in my book, that's the passion that drove me and seeing Wolf for Torrance, he understands the entire Christian life is described by grace. And grace is God giving himself so that we would share in his life. And so the book kind of goes through doctrine or, or theme by theme, you know, Trinity, Christology, pneumatology, the spirit, anthropology, humanity, the church, and then spiritual formation. And it had to get to spiritual formation for me because that's where we like practically live it out as individuals who are part of communities. And so what does, what is the theological grounding for this way of understanding our life with God, grace? And then how does that actually work itself out in our relationships, to, relationships with those that are not at all a part of the church, all of humanity, those that are within the church, and then with ourselves? And that's really the framework of the book and trying to, trying to make the, let the theology inform each of these spheres of our life. Um, and that's a lot why I'm still a pastor is trying to figure out, okay, how do we live this out as regular people? Can you give us uh, a single uh, short illustration of what this all means for us? like a story from your own life or um, like if you got three minutes on the plane and somebody says okay what difference does all this make or what does that mean mm -hmm. and you just gotta you gotta go right to something mm -hmm. what would you say how would you answer so I go right to saying I grew up in a world where you filled your head you open your head you fill it up and hopefully you get to pour it out sometime and I've come to see that's all a myth it doesn't connect with reality that really who I am is the way that I connect with the people, the persons in my life, it includes God. I just know he wanted to speak, but once I could hear what he wanted to say, what God wanted to say to me, I could hear my spouse, I could hear my kids, it opened up a whole new way of understanding who I am in the midst of a grand journey of growing as a person with others, and that's what it's about. And to live playfully and joyfully within that is really the call of my life. Do you want to come along? I mean, that's as simple about as the plain talk mm -hmm. gets. Mm -hmm. I don't download doctrine. I invite them into my experience of the, the love of God and that we experience that as persons. Which is the point. Which is the point. Which it's is relational. Right. Which is relational, <laughs> yeah. Jesus but even relational. To download doctrine. Relational, I always have to say, now when I say relational, I don't mean the relational right. in your head. I think about this person. With McMurray, I say, if I don't act with you, if I don't put out my hand and say, John, good to meet you. Good to meet you, Marty. In the <laughs> act of doing that, our relationship is actualized. Mm -hmm. We're doing something. So if I say I love you but don't act like it, I don't have a relationship of love with you. I just have something in my head about you, and that is idealism. I just have the idea of relationship. Back to play McMurray was against that. Torrance was against that. Because it's a play against the thinking we're doing something but not actually doing it. All meaningful knowledge is for the purpose of action. Right. What does love look like in action? The purpose of relation, serving relationship. And the relationship has to act. Mm -hmm. It can't just stay in your head. Though we reflect on it and think about it, 
so it can come back and act differently. That's the whole, from that comes science, from that comes art, all of those are the reflective ways that we think to come back and act towards the other in ways that are appropriate to the nature of the relationship. And I think McMurray is the one that gave Torrance the ability to see the other as person in a way, to know how to respond to the other who is personal in a way that Polanyi and Einstein and all those didn't. They brought the person knowing, but I think McMurray is the one that opened the way for the other as the one who is known. And hence his concept of onto relations, I think was grounded in McMurray's linking hmm. in the human sphere. Yeah. Though obviously language of perigrasis and all that's important, but I think McMurray gave it human content that really gave it life in a way that has not been recognized. He's just, he's just getting a kick out of McMurray did that. It's a fun thing. So Cross-fertilization <laughs> within the community of reciprocity. Bro. There it is. There it is. Jordy, how about you? Uh, <coughs> you know, one of my early experiences, this actually while I was up in seminary at Regent, um, I remember just crying out to God, like, you know, who am I to you? What's my name? Um, kind of going through a bit of an identity crisis, and I was actually snowshoeing on the top of uh, is that Mount Seymour up there, you know, the, the, the mountains that are just uh, north of Vancouver. And, um, and I had this clear sense that God, God saying, you are my beloved son. And when, when I heard, when I, you know, I didn't hear a voice, but like it was very strong sense, and I'm like, well, that can't be right. I mean, there must be something more interesting or, you know, that's maybe too obvious, you know, give you another chance. And, and that came again, and there was just this um, reality that, that I am not alone, that I am loved, and that's where I have to start every day. Um, when I wake up in the morning, I have to remember, this is who you are, this is who I am. You know, the Father saying, Jordy, you are my beloved son. Um, live out of that. Um, you don't have to achieve your identity. Um, this is the most important reality about you. And when I start there, then I can, then I just, things like anxiety and fear and shame, they lose their power. Um, they also, when they, when they come up in me, they become triggers that I'm actually, I've lost connection with the reality that I'm the beloved. And um, that's, for me, like that's the foundational spiritual discipline is to start there every morning and probably several times during the day um, when I get disconnected and the triggers, you know, for me, the, the canaries in the mind are like feeling anxious, feeling fearful, huh. weighted by guilt, feeling shame. Um, those are all signs of the disconnection. Those are, in a sense, they can be black holes that send me into the netherland or they can be um, a call back to the Father's voice. I mean, trying to get, I'm trying to lead people pastorally to the place to where they can be aware of what you just said. Yeah. Because a lot of us just disappear yeah. and don't know we've disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware that there is such a thing as triggering or disassociating or, you know. Right. Um, so or we get so used to that space of, of anxiousness, that's all we know. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, so uh, until we can identify, it seems to me, um, until I can identify some of my emotions, or some of my thoughts, or some of my interest as my participation in the Father, Son, Spirit. Mm -hmm. It still remains, I'm sharing in the divine life, but I don't know what, right. that doesn't connect with my emotional world, doesn't connect with my, my interest in making fishing lures. Right. You know, but when I begin to identify those things, I'm okay now. Yeah. And then you put, oh, you overlaying that uh, with the psychological dimension, mm -hmm. that you know, when I triggered, this happened, this happened, that's a sign that I'm disconnected, I've just mm -hmm. lost touch mm -hmm. with my identity in Jesus, I started right. believing that I was separated. In my book, The Patmos, um, there's one scene where he says to Aiden, John, says, you've seen me at prayer every morning. I rise and I don't move until I hear Jesus speaking his I am inside me. Then I'm, then I'm ready to go. So he saw his entire life as nothing other than participating in that relationship. So very, the, the sacred secular uh, dichotomy is killing us. And that's like all that we're talking about here 
is great, but if we don't begin to identify that with our humanity, right. we're still overlaying this over a sacred sector right. uh, divide. And uh, yeah. that's so, say more about that because that, that's a piece that you've done a lot of work on that I think is really helpful, but it still is challenging to figure out. Okay, so is it the things that I love that become signs of the life of God in me, or how, how would you describe that? So I love to 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 ride a bike or um, to walk by a lake or... Yesterday, in my last lecture at our conference, I asked the people to write down five things that they absolutely love, that nobody has to motivate them to even think about, just write them down. And so, and then I asked them later, I said, now ask Jesus how, how he relates to those five things, because I want them to discover that uh, you, my love for my granddaughter the origin of that is not in me. Mm -hmm. The origin is the Father, Son, and Spirit, and I get to share in their love and love her with it. And if I can see that as God, mm -hmm. as the Father, Son, and Spirit, then not only does it give me permission, but it gives me a freedom to enjoy. This is the most amazing thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've loved my children, but something's happened in the 58 years mm -hmm. in my life that I'm looking at this child and I'm watching her every single day. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is, this is amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something and then the same for me, like my love for fishing or my love for, I mean, John and I have been friends forever. We talk about John's gospel. We talk about, we play golf. When, uh, either I see all of that as, that's just me and John, or that is the Father, Son, and Spirit in us, sharing, connecting, touching. Uh, and then how that works over into their, your children and, um, and with Terry, and then how that works back in, in terms of my life. And all of a sudden, it's, it's just not me and John. It's us and, it's, and the whole of our humanity is the place where this Trinitarian life is being lived out. It, it's a disaster for me if we don't go there because it, it's still abstract. Right. Mm -hmm. And people, people um, in our culture today, which is racked with meaninglessness because they don't have, our culture doesn't have a Christology that says, I am your meaning. And it's racked with a sacred secular dichotomy so that you, the farmer or the garbage collector still thinks I can go to church and connect with Jesus, but doesn't see his garbage collecting as the very body of Christ. Right. It is Jesus serving and sharing his life with us in that concrete way. And when that comes, when people begin to see themselves that way, they, as JB used to say, you know, Jesus took our broken humanity and sanctified it and gave it back to us and gave, restored our dignity so that being a coach or a mother or a, a grandmother or a, a garbage collector is divine. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Uh, I don't know about McMurray's golf game, but anyway. Not divine. The best is right. I don't know what it is. Something in the world. Um, sometimes it feels like it is. <laughs> um, couple things. One, I also find in that in that meaningless Baxter that, uh, especially um, with younger people, they're. Uh, I think of JB's statement. They're they're going back into themselves in a psychological search, in the search for self, yep. and that that's where the answer will be found. If I can if I can see the difference between the true me and my ego, then I can sort this all out. And this is all absent Jesus, all absent relationship with yep. the, the one who made you and crafted you this way. Mm -hmm. And I I think that that's that's disastrous. I mean, and it's, a, it's another dead end, but I still have to walk it to you find gotta, out. You've got to go through it. To yeah, there. I have to walk to find out, which brings me to the other thought of what, what you guys are saying and what you're bringing in your books, which is so, I think, wonderful, is, I mean, my own history, the way God was presented to me as an individual, not a, a community in communion, mm -hmm. everything about, I'll say him, as the individual, because he was isolated, he was, he was out there. Everything about him, every effort or attempt to describe him or to even know him was in the abstract. Mm -hmm. It was not relational in the way that you've described relational. Yeah. And as long as I keep it in the abstract, it can't get to spiritual formation. It becomes a discipline without God. It right. simply becomes self-discipline. Right. Right. Idolatry. There's an externality. Yeah. To and that's what I'm saying. I was about to say it. And then it morphs into idolatry right. because it's just a matter of me setting things up. Mm -hmm. And so what is so wonderful 
by grounding it in this theology, you guys have actually something meaningful to say and to offer. To As, everything. Yes, to everything and to everyone. And every person. Yeah. yeah. Regardless of religions, cultures, or anything. And, that, and that's, that's, that's truly a gift. That's really I, think, a gift. I think that when Paul says, the mystery hidden before the foundation of the world, but now being manifest uh, in and through the saints, Christ in you, the assurance of glory, I think that's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm seeing Jesus everywhere. And when we can identify Jesus in us, then we have meaning. In our culture right now, we've lost a meaningful Christology that speaks to our humanity. And, and so all we have is one more grand scheme after another to give ourselves significance. It's another scheme. It, it's, yeah. it's like it's, I watch, because I love to watch football, and, um, but I, I watch the way we, we so desperately try to make football something other than a game. This is the Super Bowl, the playoffs, and it's like, Hush tones. And even the Masters, which you know I love, John. <laughs> if you win the Masters and you're not enjoying the Holy Spirit in every shot, you don't win anything. You don't win anything that's meaningful to you. I'm not saying, I'm saying it's there. It's about our awareness. When I have become aware of the fact that I am living in union with Jesus and I can actually, and this is, this is amazing to me because it's one thing to feel the joy of the spirit. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different thing when you recognize that you're, when you are, when you experience the Holy Spirit enjoying you. Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. that is to me, mm -hmm. that's what makes golf golf. Mm -hmm. uh, I become conscious of not only uh, because what, what the Father, Son, and Spirit love is sharing their idea with you, and then that coming out as Jordan, not not as Baxter. You're not you're not quoting them. And that's the participation. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know that you're participating, then what you're creating here becomes something that you're trying to get something from right. rather than enjoying it there right. and being free to express it. So what's that look like? So, you know, the golfer, the tennis player, the soccer player, all these beautiful sports at times. <laughs> um, so they, they, love, they love the sport and they have you know, great joy at the sport. What, what's, the, what's the change in their experience when there's a sense of when I do this, I'm participating in God. That's not just abstract, but actually like, you, you, you sort of said it, but I'm just wanting to hear you say it again, because, because that's a real question, like how does this become lived and not just in the head? Well, I, that's what I'm saying is that there's, we are, this conversation is in the spirit. Um, it is the Father, Son, and Spirit sharing ideas life with us and we get to talk about this mm -hmm. together and it's great but somebody can memorize this conversation and not have the same thing mm -hmm. and so what i the piece i'm adding or i'm seeing now is that when i begin to be conscious of the holy spirit enjoying me you know i mean like this is like i i, I the first time i experienced it i was aware of i was driving up the road uh, on Interstate 40 going to Nashville, and I felt joy. I was enjoying this moment. And then it hit me that what I was really experiencing was the Holy Spirit was enjoying me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that can't be. Mm -hmm. and, no, it can be. Mm -hmm. And in Paul's book, The Shack, that scene where Papa and Mackenzie are having scones on the back porch, and Mackenzie says, how can you not be disappointed in me? I've, all these things I've thought and all this stuff that I've done and Papa rolls out this, this gem like, okay, if I know it's going to take you 152 times to go from where you are to here, I'm not disappointed at 35. That's real. The Holy Spirit, because the way our minds in the, in, the, in the Western world, it's like until we get perfect, we're no damn good. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you miss feeling the joy in all of this from the Holy Spirit's perspective.